Uh, yeah, hold on one second. I'm okay. uh, was trying to anonymize another. Um, to, uh, let me get out of this. Brent, do you want to show some then? If if Seth's still. Oh no, I have. I can. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. No, go. Please go. No, All right. I just started the recording. Welcome everybody. This is Travis. Howard and Jeff are both away this week, but we are going to show some cases regardless, even though it's a smaller group. And Brent is going to start. You should have the invite. Okay, can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay, okay. So I may have shown this about a year ago, but uh, I can't remember if I definitely did or not, but um, I'll show it again since it's a good good case. Um, this is a 35-year-old uh, man, and this just came across again today, uh, across the desk again today, and start to uh, see, um, we're looking at the um, heart, um, the heart, even for this non-contrast study, you can see that it's abnormal. You can see that um, there's a little bit of, I would argue that this is not really a vascular distribution of fat, a little bit of fat on the subendocardial um, LV. And you can see that um, if that's in the subendocardial, then the wall is very thin. So you can tell the wall is very thin. The left ventricle is enlarged. And this patient clinically, um, and the atrium is enlarged, this patient clinically has um, you know, a low EF, um, can't remember what exactly it is, but it's around 30 or 40 percent. And um, the other abnormal thing here is, of course, look at the soft tissues, uh, just diffuse fatty atrophy of all of the the uh, muscles of the, most of the muscles of the thorax here. And this is a case of a patient with um, um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy uh, who has cardiomyopathy related to muscular dystrophy. So I just thought, again, it was a nice example of that. Um, you know, just dramatically, dramatic atrophy for 35, certainly, and, uh, um, you know, a uh, cardiomyopathy that's related to that that we don't get to see, uh, certainly don't get to see every day. So I just thought that would bring that case back. Steve on. So, Brent, that's really interesting because a, I sh – hey, Brent, I showed a case of yep. – uh, I showed a couple of cases of Duchenne muscular dystrophy where it was more, we had cardiac MRs and it was more of a myocarditis picture where there was enhancement in the inferolateral and basal inferior walls. Seth, do you remember that or have you seen some of these? I do. That, I, that was a very cool case. I do remember that well. Huh, yeah, because yeah, we've had a couple of them. This is, this is interesting though because this is a different pattern. Brent, Brent would you? Can you stand down? And, can we look at the diaphragm cruise and see if that's yeah. involved too? And it actually looks fairly healthy. Not too bad, right? Not too much fat speckling in it. There's a little bit of fat, right, it's David? Uh, uh, or... Uh-huh. There is a little bit. And I guess all the way around, as it comes around, we see some more, a little bit of speckling. and But it's not as bad as I would expect, maybe, but... Uh-huh. But there is some fat there. There is no evidence of endoleak up here too. But that's interesting. Uh, I wonder, Travis, with those cases you're talking about, um, were those? Um, I think I may have missed one, one of those. But um, you know, were those uh, advanced cases, or were those what? What sort of? No, they spectrum? were they were fairly early cases, and we've got one of the cardiologists that's doing some some research studies on their muscular dystrophy patients, and Charlie Higgins said that. And I think it's a parvovirus. You know, the, the distribution is similar to what you see with some viral myocarditis, and there's some genetic link. You know, the, the idea was that that's why the, the inferolateral wall is susceptible, you know, in areas that you often see um, by viral myocarditis. But these are more advanced, so maybe, you know, the, their entire LV function was decreased. So maybe over time you just get fatty replacement everywhere. Yeah, fat, right, exactly. I mean, to get the fatty metaplasia is not unexpected. Um, if, even if it's chronic myocarditis, we have cases that progress to fatty metaplasia. It's just, I, I've not seen this before. It's pretty, pretty neat. Again, seeing this advanced with flow. You wonder if some of these little foci of fat are due to, you know, the, you know, kind of burned out phase as well, you know. Um, but, all right. Hey, 
let me uh, go on to this case. Um, this is a really uh, interesting case, uh, courtesy of um, Arch Stillman. Um, and this patient, let me show you a couple of, uh, here the SSFP uh, sequence here, Not you can see that. Yet. Oh, sorry, sorry. Got it, okay. All right, and you can see that um, the abnormality here, and I'll tell you the patient's history in a second, but you can see, you know, obviously pleural fusions here, but the dramatic thing on these few images is that you can see that the left atrium is very, very thick here, much thicker than normal. In fact, you can see the normal right atrium right there, thickness of right atrium. The, um, the myocardium of the left ventricle is not all that thick here, so dramatic thickening of the left atrium. Let me show you the uh, motion here, not moving very well at all. Um, you know, you have some tricuspid uh, insufficiency here, but look at that dramatic um, kind of hypokinesis uh, of the, of the, uh, the left atrium. Also the, you know, of course the, the left ventricle is not moving very well either. Let me show you the, um, here's a order three chamber view. Let me show you some of the uh, delayed enhancement images here. And let me get a better one here. So let's see. I'm trying to find the most dramatic one. Okay, so here you go. Um, starting to see just um, pretty dramatic enhancement of the. Here's a better one of the left atrium along that area of thickening, and you do have a little bit of basal septal enhancement of the left ventricle as well. And and now I'll give you the history of the patient. This is a patient with known um, amyloid. And um, they, um, you know, have, um, they've been on treatment, apparently, I don't know the, um, you know, the length of the treatment, um, <clears throat> but presumably this is, um, this is due to amyloid with a predominantly left atrial um, pattern. And I'll tell you, they have not, not to my knowledge, had um, AFib ablation either to explain this, and you can see that there wasn't really, um, you know, noticeable mitral insufficiency either, anything else that would suggested possible cause for this abnormality. So presumably this is amyloid that's predominantly affecting this area of the left atrial wall and the basal septum. So I was wondering if you all had seen, you know, similar cases before, because I've never seen a case like this. Um, Dr. Stillman has not seen a case like this, I don't believe either, so. Yeah, we've, I've had a case of biatrial, severe biatrial thickening with more mild ventricular involvement. Just looking at the morphology of the ventricles, it, it, it looks like a restrictive kind of physiology as well. I, I'd be curious what they saw in echo if you did diastolic. It kind of has a funnel-shaped appearance, but I, I have seen the biatrial predominant stuff. Um, but it, anyways, you know, it, it, is, it is cool. We, we've seen the, uh, the biatrial um, predominance, but we, you know, uh, not seen the... You, you know, the, just the left atrium being affected. So no, I haven't seen just no, just an isolated atrium. No, I haven't. I haven't um, you know, I haven't seen that. It was, yeah, I have this restrictive pattern, and but I just thought that was extremely interesting. <laughs> um, okay, I'll move on to this. Was a uh, going back to the lungs here for a second. Um, this is a patient who has this CT, and this kind of I, I love this case because. It underscores uh, a certain differential that I like to employ when um, other more common differentials are not uh, present. So here is a patient who is, um, I believe this is a 45. I'm not seeing your screen. Am oh, I not seeing your I'm no, not seeing your Apologize, apologize, apologize. Okay, there we go. Um, this is a 45-year-old patient, I believe, who has the only abnormality on this, on this chest CT is um, this bronchial thickening, and you can see that it's more subtle on the left, um, but on the right, certainly in the right upper lobe, you can see it's pretty pronounced bronchial wall thickening, and um, let's scan down to the lower lobe. There's really not much else going on in the lungs, but just this bronchial wall thickening, and of course, you know, after I exhaust the common things that can cause this, like asthma and acute bronchitis, chronic bronchitis, smoking of any kind, um, then I start delving into the um, other different, and I know that um, you know uh, other people have seen 
uh, these cases before too, where um, you'll have a very early or, or mild um, ABPA that can start like this that doesn't have much bronchiectasis, and so there's a spectrum of ABPA that can look like this. Um, you can find cases of adult onset cystic fibrosis that just present with bronchial thickening, and you can find cases of eosinophilic bronchitis that, that look like this. And so I like to kind of use those as an, as an extended differential. And this patient, um, let's take a look at another study I have pulled up here. And you can see that on this um, sinus CT that they had done, they had um, you know a lot of sinus disease here. And this patient also has a peripheral um, eosinophilia uh, that's about um, 15 to 20 percent of the um, of the total differential. So this is a patient um, who has and and let me top it off by saying that there's an outside CT that I don't have that apparently shows ground glass. Um, fleeting opacity. So this is a patient with sort of Strauss syndrome who doesn't um, have, um, who has, uh, you know, four of the, the six required uh, diagnostic criteria in that he has sinusitis and um, asthma slash eosinophilic bronchitis um, and has sinusitis and um, fleeting airspace opacities um, and a peripheral is so I just thought this was a, a good case of sure Strauss uh, that at this point is just presenting with this pretty pronounced bronchial uh, thickening. So, oh. anyway, um, and then I just want to just quickly show this one. This is a, uh, don't know if people have been seeing these. Let me show the screen here. Let's see. Okay. Portable chest x ray. And um, don't know if people have been seeing these pop up yet or not, but um, you can see this device, uh, lattice-like device projecting over the left, uh, over the mitral valve plane. And you can see that this little, what looks like a clip here is actually part of this device. And let me show you a better uh, chest x-ray. The 2V radiograph shows, um, of another patient shows the same device, this expandable device here, mitral valve, and then there's an anchor point here. Here's the, the lateral showing that. And let me bring up the video of what this is. This is the tendine um, bioprosthetic mitral valve system that's implanted through a uh, left thoracotomy through a um, apical uh, approach through the ventricle. And let me show you how that. Have other people seen this uh, yet? No. Let me uh, pull up the. Can you see the video? No. Okay, let me let me pull up the. Okay, can you see it now? Yeah. Okay, let me uh, back this up because. Uh, can you see the blown up video? No, nope, now we lost it. No. Oh shoot. Okay, I'll just make it back. Okay. So anyway, the idea is that this is done through a um, an apical approach through the left ventricle, and you can see this is part of the device that goes in. And here's the mitral valve, and there's a um, anchor point at the left ventricular apex that this thing is anchored along, and they're putting in part of that. Part of this is the deployment system, and then here comes the large bore deployment catheter and they're going to slide the valve out on top of this and expand it um, in a second. Here it is. So this is a, you know, it just kind of coats and enlarges and, and sits along the annulus here. And then the bioprosthetic valve is in the center of it. And then as they're bringing, this is coming in from the left ventricular apex. And so now they're going to come out in a second. And okay, so they're coming back through. And then what's going to be left here is this anchor point. So this is going to be anchored, and they're going to show to the uh, apex right here. So that anchors it all in. So anyway, that is the tendine um, mitral valve um, that goes in over this this catheter. So so it's under you know it's undergoing trials now, and it's uh, I would expect these to be seen more widely in, in just a bit. So I just thought that was interesting. And uh, just one, one uh, oh, sorry, what was that? Okay, let me just show one last case. This, again, is courtesy of uh, Dr. Stillman. 
And uh, this is a patient who um, had some outside studies um, due to an abnormality that was seen um, after pacemaker placement and lead revision. And here's the aortogram that we have, the catheters in the aorta. And let me make sure that I can show this. Okay. So, so the aortic injection, let me let, let it scroll through again. We have the aortic injection, and then soon after that, you see dramatic opacification of um, the left anatomic vein, and then um, all the veins of the thorax right here. So um, this was concerning for, obviously, for some sort of fistula at some level between the aorta or one of the aortic branches, and um, presumably, let's look here again, the most, the earliest thing to pacify is the anatomic vein. So. Um, so Art saw this and was concerned for a fistula. So we got a CTA. And so let me scroll through that one, make sure this is showing here. OK. And here's the CTA. So you can see that here's the fistula between the right, um, you know, between the brachiocephalic artery and stretching across here. It's about a four or five uh, millimeter wide opening uh, fistula here that goes to this really deformed looking um, vein. So to the anominate vein, left anominate vein. I'll show you that the rest of the anominate vein is really not, not you know, it's, it's stenotic or, um, you know, here. And you can see this irregularity of the vein, uh, presumably due to, you know, some damage from the, uh, the lead uh, revision and placement. So um, this is a, uh, a nice case of a fistula that was presumably created um, through pacemaker placement and manipulation between the right brachiocephalic artery and the anominate vein here. So um, just a nice correlation with the aortogram. And you can see it in the, in the coronal, I'll show it to you here. Let's take a look at that. You can see here the, the fistula right here. Um, and you can see all these varices light up not only just the um, the jugular and everything, but also just um, you know some varices in the anterior neck light up as well due to this um, relatively high flow fistula. So I just thought that was an interesting case. Very cool. Yeah, anyway, that's those are my my cases for now. That's awesome. Thanks, Seth. Do you want to show some? Yeah. All right. Sure. All right. So. Uh... A few weeks ago, I, I think maybe a few months ago, I showed my, uh, broke my cherry on my first uh, unicuspid valve, or uh, quadricuspid valve, and now um, I saw my first unicuspid valve, which I was very excited about, but we can see this very dysmorphic, it's not really unicuspid, it's more unicommissural, so there's uh, not really a commissure except for this kind of attachment in the region of what would or should theoretically be between the left and right. Um, and it's just this dysmorphic, thickened, calcified valve. You can talk about doming, um, and this thing is just definition of a dome valve. And uh, it was taken out and proven to be a uh, unicuspid valve, and it's uh, just study of that. But you know, it was interesting, and I think it's just due to the fact that these are much more symptomatic. Our our pathologist wasn't was surprised that I was excited about that case because he says he sees them all the time um, because they're usually symptomatic but the quadricuspid valves he's never he's seen one in many many years and I think that's because they're predominantly asymptomatic and an incidental finding. Uh, Seth how old is your patient with this unicuspid valve? Uh, she was like 34. Okay. Um, and this is this is a case where I thought it, it's a nice case if people want to have stuff in their teaching files for showing the gr progressive surgeries for patients with obstructive right-sided lesions. So this is a girl that was a day old um, and has tricuspid atresia, um, large ASD, large VSD, hypoplastic right heart, and um, has also a truncus and it doesn't matter the complexity of it, but basically has a truncus, and here is the 
left PA being supplied off of that truncus, but the right PA was being supplied by these MAPCAs. Um, so I don't know if you want to, what people want to call it, if it's truncus versus hemitruncus versus TET variant with tricuspid atresia. It doesn't really matter. It's an obstructive right-sided lesion. Um, the first surgery that these patients go to is a BT shunt for to relieve the obstruction or to provide flow to the uh, PAs and then to create a, um, you know, basically with the hypoplastic right heart, create a, a monoventricle system. So this patient has undergone that. Basically, both chambers now fill a large vessel, which is the aorta, and the pulmonary arteries are filled through the BT shunt, which you can see here supplying the pulmonary arteries. And then the next stage is the Glenn operation where the patient goes, and these are all like a year apart. So then the Glenn operation, the patient undergoes where they get the SVC um, attached to the, so the BT shunt gets ligated so you don't have arterial supply to the pulmonary arteries. And then you get a BT shunt where you get um, SVC flow to the pulmonary arteries. And I'll try to show it here. It's hard to show, but in a single, a nice single picture, but you can see here is brachiopharynx coming brachiopharynx SVC SVC coming down and then supplying both pulmonary arteries. Let's see if I can get that in a single shot. I know I can. Um, so here we can see. So that's the Glenn procedure, and then after that, a few years after that, the patient then undergoes completion of the circuit, where now the IVC is um, brought up to connect to the one pulmonary artery, and, and, is, and so the, what they do is they kind of change things around where the SVC is kind of directed more towards one pulmonary artery, and then the IVC flow is kind of directed towards the other pulmonary artery, and that completes, so that's the Fontan. Um, you know, there's lots of ways you can do a Fontan. This one looks more like graft material. A lot of times they use pericardium, uh, and you can see here the Glenn portion and then the IVC portion creating the Fontan circuit supplying um, pulmonary artery blood flow. And that's basically the treatment for a obstructive right-sided lesion with either a single outflow, tr outflow uh, artery or a monoventricle approach. And it's just nice to have basically see that progression from birth through uh, maturity or she's not mature, four or five years old. Uh, this voting. is a case where, I'm sorry? I said voting age, but. <laughs> yeah. So you can see, I just did this case about an hour ago. Um, and I'm curious if anyone has seen this before, because I, I sure haven't. So this is a patient who had a non-con crash CT. You could clearly tell in the non-con CT that there was an, a vascular malformation and then there was this um, prominence in the in the region of the left superior pulmonary vein, so um, assumed it was some sort of arterial valve venous malformation, which it was. What's interesting is two things. One, I'm not, I don't know if it's true or not. I, I was wondering if there was some sort of direct communication there but directly between the left upper lobe pulmonary artery and the vein. That's not what's, what's interesting. What, what's interesting here is watch this vessel go down. It goes down. It actually connects through the diaphragmatic surface into these diaphragmatic vessels, and these both hook in to the respective internal mammary arteries. So there is a um, pulmonary artery, slash, and then this does connect the pulmonary vein as well. So there's a pulmonary slash pulmonary artery AVM, but it's also being fed by systemic feeders from the in both internal mammary arteries. And then there's another little AVM down here. And I actually talked to the patient. Um, he, was a, he was a vet. He was about 40 years old. And I actually talked to him. And, you know, I was like, do you have nosebleeds? And he's like, yeah, I get nosebleeds all the time. And I was like, well, you may want to, you know, he had never been diagnosed with this. And so he probably, probably a case of Oswald-Berondu, HHT. But I'm curious if anyone has seen a pulmonary arterial venous malformation connect with systemic collaterals like that. No, but I saw a case yesterday in a patient who'd had a, a liver transplant recently, and he had what looked like a, a, an acquired 
like AV fistula from an, an inferior phrenic artery to a pulmonary vein, which I had never seen before either. I, I didn't pull that one up to show it, but that this just reminded me of that. But I've never seen this. Yeah, I, I it's just weird. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's just an interesting case. And then this was show the unicuspid valve. Show that. Oh, lastly, so this is a uh, something we don't see as much here as, as Travis sees. Um, but this is a guy where, so whenever I see an anterior kind of mediastinal mass with lymphadenopathy growing into the chest wall, you know, I, I often think of, in a young patient, I, I often think of Hodgkin's lymphoma because I know that likes to grow in the chest wall. But there was a lot of lymphadenopathy. There's a lot of lymphadenopathy elsewhere. There was other stuff going on in the lungs. Um, and turns out this guy was or is a priest who had spent a fair amount of time in, uh, just got back from uh, South and Central America. And you could see that this, no, these are not pretty, I apologize. I thought we had prettier, I have prettier images somewhere. But you can see that there's all this lymphadenopathy. This thing starts in the anterior mediastinum, grows out into the chest wall through the anterior mediastinum. And uh, this was, of course, going to be tuberculosis. Uh, so this is a case of tuberculosis with empyema necessitans, um, which I have, I don't think I, I have seen a case of this since I was a resident in Colorado. Uh, and here you can see it. And I, this, I have to say, this was an MSK. The reason it's so ugly is this was an MSK uh, MRI to look at the osteo. So this wasn't one of our chest ones. We would have made the images look prettier. But you can see this extending through all these enhancing lymph nodes. And then they got a belly CT as well, which shows um, the findings that you would expect kind of with all these splenic lesions, you know, those little splenic lesions from TB and some other abdominal findings. Anyways, a case of disseminated TB with empyema, necessitans or necessitatus, which, again, I, I haven't seen a case in a long time. So those are uh, my four cases. Brent, Brent probably sees more of that at, at uh, Grady, since I don't have that connection anymore. But those are great. Dave, you, don't do you, see, you don't see it up in San Fran? Well, most of them go to the general, and we don't cover there. So, oh, you don't? Okay. No. Unfortunately. Well, for better or for worse. Um, David, do you have any to show? I have a few, yeah. Okay. Good. Let me change to you. I've got plenty. I'll just, after you're done, I'll just... Wrap up the hour. Okay. <clears throat> so this first is a forty-some-year-old uh, man who has these very vague nodules on chest radiographs. Can you guys see? Yes. Okay. And you get the impression that there are a few nodules scattered around there. He had this CT scan around this time, and he has these stellate lesions here, sort of soft-looking. Um, seem to be around vessels and airways, not particularly hugging the hyla, but we get some flaminess here, some maybe flame-like radiation from the hyla. Um, and this is Kaposi sarcoma in a fellow who had had HIV uh, detected, I think, more than 10 years ago, but had decided not to take his medications. And um, things got a little bit worse over the next month or two. So this CT scan shows larger nodules in the same, roughly the same distribution as before. <clears throat> and this was uh, Kaposi sarcoma. He also has um, some skin lesions, so I can show you what his feet look like here. So this, this is Kaposi sarcoma involving his lower extremity here. That's crazy. Pretty ugly looking. Okay, so at least we got to add some color to our usual drab black and white CT presentations. Now, when so that they, was Kaposi sarcoma. When they do bronchoscopy, they'll often see airway lesions that can look similar to that too. Is that correct? 
Because I always think yes, okay. they often they can often see them in the in the in the submucosa, right? I don't know whether they did in this case, but he had biopsy proved post sarcoma coming from his lower extremity, but also from bronchoscopy. So I don't know whether they saw anything. I'll I'll review the report with that question in mind. But um, they did they did make a biopsy diagnosis of Kaposi in his lung as well. Okay, um, let me show you this case. Um, all right, so this this person has um, got a bone marrow transplant. And initially had clear radiographs, and then his radiographs began to sort of cloud up, um, develop this diffuse lung disease, and things got worse and worse. So here he is a few weeks after that initial clear radiograph and he now has diffuse lung disease, he's very dysmic and he had this CT scan which shows just this intermediate density stuff throughout the lungs, very, you know, not very helpful and accompanying pleural effusions and basal atelectasis and uh, he was, he got bronchoscopy and alveolar lavage and this is a picture of the lavagate uh, which got progressively redder as the lavage fluid came back. So this is classic diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. So when they begin to get the return from their lavage, you know, it goes from pink to bloodier and bloodier, and this is what it looked like here. It's, it's nice in a it's in a beaker ready for serving at your at your uh, McDonald's. Okay, so I wanted to add some color today. So here's diffuse alveolar hemorrhage in a in a glass for you. And then uh, this person <clears throat> um, has CLL and had a cough and fever. This was a, an, an earlier radiograph showing maybe just a little scarring or low-grade consolidation in the bases here. That was in February. And then five months later, we have this dramatic consolidation down here. And it seems to be anterior in middle lobe. Also, there's a posterior component. He got CT, and he has emphysema, and he has this dense consolidation here in middle lobe and lower lobe. And my, my first thought would be that this was a pneumonia, and it, in this distribution, it could be an aspiration pneumonia. It seems to be trying to be dependent on that side. Um, but this was um, myocardia. So CLL is, is a risk factor. I mean, it is an immune-compromising condition. And uh, people with CLL who are not on steroids or anything like that can get pneumocystis pneumonia from their CLL because their lymphocytes are not working. Even if they have a large number of lymphocytes, they're not effective. So it's like being lymphopenic in terms of risk factor for pneumocystis. But I was not aware that they're also predisposed, as in this case, to nocardia. Now, they've changed the name of the Nocardia species. It used to be Nocardia asteroides, and now they've changed it. It's got some other name, but they say formerly, in parentheses, formerly, you know, asteroides. So um, it's the same bug, evidently, but it got a new name. So Nocardia in the setting of CLL. This is my first, first case of Nocardia in this situation. And no color picture on this one. How sick was he? I think he was fairly ill, but um, I can go back and check. I'm, I'm just curious, like if if he would present like a fulminant bacterial pneumonia, or if it's more of an of an indolent subacute presentation. Let me check on that, and I'll put that in the notes when I send the case. Okay. All right, that's it. Yeah. All okay, right, great, thanks. Okay, I'm going to show my screen. So I've got a, a hodgepodge of different things today. Do you guys see a chest radiograph? Yes. So this is a quick one that I saw a couple days ago. And you, you see he has an azagous fissure here, what looks like an azagous fissure. And there's, you know, the lung was a little busy up here, which I didn't like. He has some emphysema. I didn't know if there was going to be something there. That's not the important thing. But this is just a variant that I haven't seen because he does have a, what looks like an azagous fissure. But if you look at this, that it's actually not the azagous vein that's in there because this vein is just 
a superior intercostal vein. He has no azagous vein at all. And this continues down. So it's kind of a, a, I mean, unless you want to say that this is maybe what the azagous vein was coming from the hemiazagous, but it just, you know, it turns into a, a large superior intercostal vein, which then occupies this area. So I don't know what to call this other than a variant of, a, of an azagous fissure that has a superior intercostal vein in it. Right. It's, it's very nice and parallel to the, um, to the LSIV on the left, the, the left superior intercostal vein. Yeah. Almost... Yeah, because then, right, then you see the left superior intercostal vein here just wrapping around the aorta. Mm -hmm. So I just thought this was a cute one. And I think this is all just, he's just got some emphysema and a little bit of scar around that, I think just, which was giving that appearance. But this was just a variant I had never seen before. And I was curious if anyone else had, but you no, know, just peculiar. It's a variant. You, you got you guys in your veins. You love those veins. Yeah, it's curious. Well, as my fellow pointed out, azagous. No, it's it's fascinating. I just uh, yeah. I, well, no, no. I was gonna say my my fellow pointed out the other day that that azagous means unpaired. So, mm -hmm. which I didn't realize that that uh that that it was what azagous meant. Yeah, it actually means unyoked, as in uh, as in a team of oxen, you know, yoked together. Oh, really? Yeah. All right, let me sort by number here. This is a uh, this is one also this is courtesy of my fellow Kim who saw this one. This is a patient who as you can see is intubated. And you look here and they have not just a portion but an entire tooth. Looks like a molar that's sitting to the left of midline. So she showed this to me and of course you know wanted to know that it wasn't there before. It wasn't there before. Now she'd already been intubated this time. And it, you know, I thought at first this was going to be in the left lower low because I thought this was a little bit of atelectasis around this thing. Um, but they did a follow-up radiograph after this one because she had recently been intubated. And as you can see, it's actually in the esophagus, not in the airway because it's now in her stomach. Um, but it wasn't there on her CT that she had had. She was, I can't remember what sort of trauma she was. And, you know, it's kind of a cool, a fooler because the esophagus goes a little bit more lateral here than I would expect, or, you know, a little bit more even than the CT. But what was interesting when you looked at her trauma CT of her head and neck, let's see if this is it. Yeah, here's, here's her endotracheal tube. And you can see this tooth right here that's loose and is like just, I mean, there's obviously loose, a bit of, loose is an understatement. I think that thing is just sitting in her mouth. Yeah, that right. Point. Yeah, it is. But they, yeah, there's a big, <laughs> there's a big carry there. So uh, they undoubtedly dislodged this when she was intubated. So it, it made the, the temporal relationship made more sense for it to be in the esophagus too, because it wasn't on the original radiograph in the trachea. And you would assume that the balloon would prevent it from going into the trachea you know, once the ET tube is in place, but it's just kind of funny that, that appearance. But I know we've seen a few teeth that have been swallowed or in the bronchi from from dislodge, dislodgement during an intubation. But I thought this was a good example. And so, David, David, this one is for you because my my fellow Kim, who loves to tune in, saw this the other day. This is a trauma patient, and she's very attuned to the diaphragm now. And she got all ex yeah. she she got potentially excited about this one because you can see that the right diaphragmatic cruce looks very thick compared to the left as you extend down. It's definitely a little asymmetric. And this was a guy that was some sort of trauma. And as you can see, he has a a, a horizontal burst fracture at this level. And so she showed this to me, and and you know I was wondering if this could be a hematoma in the diaphragmatic cruce, and I said, yeah, it looked a little bit big, but I've never seen one this juicy, but I know they can be a little asymmetric. They ended up doing a spine MR, or we looked at the spine MR. I think it's just asymmetric thickening because there's absolutely no abnormal signal intensity within this cruise on either the T1 or the, you know, on any of the sequences. And since, since she showed me this, I've seen a few cases where there is some asymmetry in the with the right cruise being larger than the left and i don't know if that's a rule of thumb that you follow or if you've paid attention to that david but i kind of think this is just a fake out from the trauma despite the fact there's this you know, adjacent 
compression fracture. I'm curious what you think. Well, the, the right cruise usually is thicker than the left, so this seems to, to be a little extreme in terms of the asymmetry, but it's probably just um, just part of the range of normal. Just I, I've not seen one this dramatically different from the other side. Yeah, neither had I. But I've looked. I've been looking at a lot of cases recently, and maybe you know, maybe there's a little bit of stranding in that in that fat at the root of the mesentery. But I wasn't. I wasn't totally convinced. And the, certainly the paravertebral area, you can still see some fat in some of these locations. And, and both both of the hemidiaphragms are at the same height. We yeah. don't have even vision on one side or the other. No, I mean... So the left, one's a little, the left one's a little higher. Yeah, not much, but yeah, just a little. But yeah, I think that this is... But yeah, I think it's probably just that they are unusually asymmetric in their appearance. I don't know. Do you have a scout view on this uh, on this case or, or no, a coronal? I can do a coronal, but but yeah, just a little a little higher. I think he's. It may be the eventration that is uh, accentuating the difference too. Yeah, I don't know, but I just thought it was interesting because he does have that compress that that transverse fracture right beside that. So. All right, this case came in yesterday, and this is the case that. This is the case that just keeps on giving here. And this, this is one of my, which is, it has now become one of my all-time favorite radiographs because there's not one or two, but three abnormalities on this radiograph. And unfortunately, I didn't see the radiograph until after kind of working backwards from the CT that I'll show you yesterday. But this is a lady who came in in 2015. She had hemoptysis. And you can see she's got consolidation in her left upper lobe with volume loss. But it has, and that's abnormality number one. And you'll see it has more of a, of a right upper lobe collapse type appearance. And I'll show you that on the CT too. It's not because the lingula is actually spared from this process as I will show you. And then of course she has some high attenuation in the, in the hilum. You don't really see a discrete mass, but we'll come back to that. And then does, that, does anyone see the other two, ab, any, either of the other two abnormalities? In the other... Yeah, compl way far away from what's going on here. One of them is down here. She, yes. has, she has this little serpentine vas vascular structure. It's pointing the opposite direction of what you would think a scimitar would point. And then she also has a very subtle left paraspinal abnormality right here. And I will show you on the CT that this violates the, the law of Caney because none of these three things are related to each other, which is kind of fun. Uh, but we'll keep that in mind as we move on to her CT. And I'll show you her CT from 2015 first. So this is her original CT. And you can see that she has some consolidation with volume loss in that left upper lobe. It's sparing the lingula. You can see she has a mucus-impacted bronchi. And of course, she was referred because they thought this was essentially obstructing cancer. But you can see that the, she has these big, chunky calcifications right in the vicinity of the left upper lobe bronchus as you would expect it to, you know, to branch into the left upper lobe versus the lingula. And I think you can see here on the coronal. So this certainly looks like a broncholith. Uh, she was referred for surgery, got a PET CT when she got here. And this is a PET CT is a month later. Let me get back to the axial. And the PET itself is not going to be very helpful because as you will see, the calcification if you do a count of the number of, of calcified liths here, that there were three on the prior, one, two, and then three. And by this time, a month later, she has decreased in the consolidation and we're down to one lith. And so I was talking to the interventional bronchoscopist yesterday because he was seeing her in follow-up in clinic. And she did say that she had coughed up some big stones back in 2015. And I, this is presumably Coxie because she's from the Central Valley here in California and has never lived elsewhere. You know, I would have think of Histo, but this is presumably from, from Coxie. So that is the broncholith with the left upper lobe collapse, sparing the lingula, simulating right Does upper lobe any, collapse. Do you have any calcified nodes anywhere? No. Not really. And she was tested for TB? I, I, I'm sure she was tested for TB. I don't and know. Nothing, that. In her spleen, nothing in her spleen? No calcification? No, no, no. Because I, I looked at that yesterday. Uh, 
But that gets us to the second abnormality. We'll f pay attention down here, that tubular thing I talked about. And you can see there's this big you know, dilated mucus-filled bronchus that abruptly ends right here. And then we have a humongous feeding vessel, which is probably, I, I don't know if it's inferior phrenic, but it's its own origin adjacent to the, to the celiac and the SMA feeding this thing. And actually, let me just go to the study from yesterday, because this will, this is, the study from yesterday is actually nicer in terms of the um, thinner cuts that'll show the rest of this. And you'll see in her lung that she has some areas of air trapping or just lucent lungs surrounding this. And there's really no bronchi in this area. So I think abnormality number two is a, is a sequestration slash bronchial atresia hybrid lesion like we've seen, given that there's no airway proximally here. We have this big dilated mucus filled thing and all of these little collaterals. Her venous drainage is normal. I didn't see any sort of, of scimitar vein. But you would agree that this is one of those hybrids? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. Both. Yeah. I mean, do, are they known to occur well, with yeah. one another? Well, Howard has pulled up, there was an article in, the, in pediatric pathology literature where often that these things coexist as like their spectrum lesions. You know, okay. I, that's, my, that's what I remember. And David and Brent may I mean, remember. I mean, it would make sense. I mean, it's, yeah. but it, I didn't know. I've not seen that. Yeah. Um, and then we get to this thing right here, which is the left paraspinal thing. Because trying to follow the law of Caney when I was looking at this yesterday, because that thing, this thing has been there and unchanged since 2015, the original study, I thought maybe it was going to be some neuroenteric cyst or something else developmental since she has this developmental thing on the right side. But it's, it's unchanged, but when you look at the PET, you'll see that that thing is fairly metabolically active. So presumably, oh, wow. presumably it's a nerve sheath tumor. It has a good look that's for even, it. That, I mean, that's even pretty active for a, yeah. a, a benign nerve sheath tumor. I mean, that's... Yeah, I know. But it's, un, it's, it's totally unchanged from her oldest study in, uh, in 2015. In, in terms of yeah. size. So. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's definitely a neurogenic tumor, but that's interesting. It's so metabolic. It looks benign, but it's yeah. very metabolic. I know. That's an, does it, yeah. Travis, it doesn't have any blood vessels going to it, or does it? It looks as if there is some. Uh, yeah, I don't know if they're going to it or going around it. You know, it's, it's intermediate attenuation. It, maybe there's a vessel right here in it. But no thought about it's being an extra low bar sequestration. That wouldn't account for its act metabolic activity, though. No, that wouldn't either. But I was thinking, you know, and it, it's a great location right at the nerve root for a nerve sheath tumor, too. Mm -hmm. So this lady had not one but three abnormalities. And you can see in her, cool. in her left upper lobe, she still has some, I think she just has some bronchial stenosis here, because you have abrupt, you have abrupt occlusion here. The one thing that bothered me yesterday is there's this weird focus of higher attenuation in here that's not stone attenuation. And I think that he was going to scope her again just to see if it's just stenosis from inflammation in the broncholith that's been passed. But this is just a bizarre case of multiple things. Travis, we, we do have at least one case of uh, combined, um, you know, sequestration or systemic arterial supply and then um, bronchial atresia. So yeah, try to bring next time. <laughs> okay. Uh, Seth, you'll like this one. This is one where I, I have a lot of doubt or had a lot of doubters. I think I've convinced them. This is a patient who had an abdomen and pelvis CT. And let's see, this looks like this is the, this is our um, more arterial phase here. Here's the, so they did a delayed phase and this is an abdomen and pelvis CT. And I'm just, just going to start from here. Now, this lady was transferred in. You can see she's got diffuse alveolar damage, and her lungs look horrible. She's intubated. And this girl's heart. Yeah, exactly. So, awesome. so, the, um, so this was originally billed as delayed enhancement in the setting of, of myocarditis. And I'll, I'll yeah. but um, so this lady had had, she's young, she had come in on around Christmas time. This is what she looked like when she was transferred to us. So clearly not doing well. 
they had done a biopsy, a, a, an endomyocardial biopsy at an outside hospital a couple days before this radiograph, before she was transferred. And it was a lymphocytic myocarditis. I'm not sure what it was, but it wasn't a giant cell myocarditis. So anyway, so that she got this study, which was an abdomen pelvis CTA, and this is the arterial phase, and then this was the delayed phase. And so, you know, my, a couple of my colleagues looked at this, and they said, well, this looks like it's just delayed enhancement and retention of contrast, you know, which makes sense since she has a no myocarditis. And they had shown me this without telling me anything. I was like, oh, that's cool. It looks like heart of stone, you know, like one of our hearts of stone we've seen. And they're like, well, but it's yeah. not on the arterial phase. We'll get back to that. But here's, this is, as you can see, 13 days later, they did a non-con study. And guess what? Dude, that's awesome. Yeah, this is so... Yeah. So it's so this is a heart of stone, and then there was this debate about well, how long can the heart actually retain contrast? Which my answer was not this long. Oh, come on, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> well, and also when you look at the arterial phase here, I think you can actually see that some of these areas in the septum have this. So me being the skeptic and the doubter of the of the myocarditis thing, went back and looked and. This was her original CT when she presented. Like I said, this is after her endomyocardial biopsy. She's, yeah. yeah, and there's nothing there. And she had actually had a cath at the outside hospital. So she had had contrast two days before this too. So my argument was, well, why doesn't she have delayed retention of contrast after two days? So I think I've proved, proven that this is another heart of stone. But she was on, she's on dialysis at this time. She's on ECMO, I think, at this time as well. But so she has all of the, the makings of a, of a heart of stone with, you yeah. know, with myocardial oh, I, I, damage, transient, at least transient renal failure with calcium and phosphate imbalance leading to this deposition. So, yeah, and I have, I have someone has from Hopkins showed me a case literally two days, two days where non-con one day had nothing. The next one, two days later, patient ARDS, acute renal failure, okay. all this stuff, heart so, of stone. That's, that's, a, that's great. So two days. Okay, good. Because I was saying certainly within a, a week or something like this. That didn't bother me. No, I, yeah, no, yeah. we have a kid. I have a kid. Literally two days. It, it's wow. unbelievable um, that yeah. this develops like that. So I, don't, great, great. I still don't know the answer to the question how long you can retain intravenous contrast in the setting of renal insufficiency, especially. But my answer was not 13 days. I don't know what the Lining, answer is. Lining your, your, so they were, they were saying that it was interstitial accumulation of Ionated contrast yeah. for, for almost days? The, yeah. almost the equivalent. Well, yeah, <laughs> sure. right. I mean, yeah, that okay. I, well, I I I would tend not to agree with that, but no, I I don't I don't think they do either. Now they were saying at least on that first yeah. study they thought it was delayed enhancement, you know, which right, yeah, but uh yeah, and Seth, this case is for you. This is the guy I texted you about last week. This was a young man who was in his usual state of health, drinking a couple of beers and smoking marijuana when he decided to smoke a friend of his girlfriend's fentanyl patch. And I didn't know, <laughs> and I didn't know that this is actually a thing, but there are YouTube videos of people smoking fentanyl patches. And I'm still not exactly sure what the, um, what the effect is because I would think that the, the fentanyl would combust along with everything else. Um, but he reports that shortly after starting to smoke his fentanyl patch, that his lungs became on fire, and then the next thing he knew, he was being resuscitated by, by, um, by EMS. But you can see he's got a, a subtle a perihilar, hazy opacities, you know, kind of a non-cardiogenic edema maybe that's developing. And here's his CT, and you can just see diffuse ground glass opacities. And I, I don't know, I, mean, I still don't see a lot of cracked lung and don't fully understand it, but he did have hemoptysis. So I guess it's I'm hemorrhage. Just, yeah, it's mostly hemorrhage. And, right? Yeah, it's just hemorrhage, as a, which would be similar to what you get with cracked lung. Is that? Yeah. Yeah, it's mostly just hemorrhage and le leakage of blood and fluid. So is he one that if they bronked him, it would, it would look like David's, you know, like that amber colored beer by the time they get done with the bronch? The lavage? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's a capillar, usually it's a capillaritis, yeah. and it's just this, this hem um, but uh, yeah, that's what I would assume. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, this looks like, you know, certainly fits with hemorrhage, and that fits with his story, and he had hemoptysis. He has a little bit of 
airway inflammation. This is probably why his airways felt like they were on fire. But, so, um, so what is what is there in the patch material besides the fentanyl? I mean, there must be a bunch of plastic and stuff like that. So, I mean, yeah, I I don't know. I, I uh, well, you should watch the video. You should watch the videos. They're they're uh, <laughs> they're pretty yeah. fascinating. Yeah, just yeah on a, on a non work computer, David. Just just do a quick <laughs> Google search for uh, smoking fentanyl patch. Um, okay. Yeah, I I don't know, but maybe this. I'm surprised this happens now that marijuana is legal here. I guess that's the next thing. It's like now that marijuana is not exciting anymore, you got to try something else. So uh, <laughs> let me show one more. I know we're right at the top of the hour. I want to show you this one really quick. This is a curiosity from yesterday. Let me make sure I show the... Uh... So on, her, on this lady's radiograph, she's in her 50s. You can see that her lungs, you know, certainly not reduced lung volumes, a little hyperinflated. And we have relative reduction in vascularity, particularly in the lower lobes. So you know where I'm going with this, at least at first. She's on our lung transplant list because she has alpha-1 antitrypsin and panacinar emphysema. You can see a good look for that in the lower lobes with just destruction of the lungs. Now here's where this case gets interesting because I saw her yesterday. I saw this CT yesterday. And the story is that she... Um, has had these skin lesions recently, and they biopsied three skin lesions, two of which had non-necrotizing granulomas, and then one of which they thought was some alpha-1 alpha antitrypsin-related skin lesion. So they were not sure what was going on, but this study was being done to rule out pulmonary sarcoid, this study that I'll show you in a second. And, um, you know, of course, I didn't expect it to be positive, but check out her lungs now. She has just diffuse, tiny little micronodules, and you can see them along the fish, uh, along the pleura. You can see them along the fissures. You know, just and they're they're almost so small that they give you more of a ground glass appearance. But I think you can tease out that these are all little tiny discrete nodules, and especially when you get to the lower lobes, let me window it maybe a little bit better. You know, some of these look like they're like more discrete, tiny little nodules, even in her areas of alpha-1 antitrypsin lung, and you can see some of these. So, and she, it turns out that she is Scandinavian, so she is from a population that gets sarcoid, but this looks like, does anybody disagree that this is some sort of sarcoid superimposed on alpha-1? I mean, well, what is the time frame between the two studies? Three years, two and a half years. And um, no lymphadenopathy yesterday. I mean, she has a couple of little sub-centimeter nodes, nothing that's enlarged, but, but she had two, two of three skin biopsies that showed non-necrotizing granulomas within the last couple of weeks. Huh. So I think this is, I, yeah. I, yeah. She's not, a, she's not on any medication that might trigger a sarcoid-like reaction. Sarcoid -like reaction. That was, yeah, that's that what... was what I thought, too. And um, no, she's on some sort of, uh, just like an antibiotic, not an antibiotic or some I, I can't remember, but it's not one of the the usual interferons or one of the usual suspects that we would. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I have no idea, but it, I mean, it, they're interesting. Their, their pretest probability was high, and this fits with that, I guess. You think they'll but, do a transplant biopsy? And I don't know. the The attending pulmonologist is out of town. She's not feeling that bad right now, at least from a respiratory standpoint. I. I Reached out to him via email yesterday. I haven't heard what the plan is yet, so we'll see. We'll figure it out when she gets her new lungs. So, yeah. are, I mean, we actually transplanted a fair, fair amount of sarcoid patients. Do you, do you guys exclude them from transplant, or is she still on the list? Um, I don't know. I'm assuming she's still on the list. We don't, we don't see a lot of sarcoid. I mean, most yeah. of our transplants are interstitial lung disease, emphysema. We just don't see much. Yeah, so. no, we, we, yeah. I mean, most of ours are... I agree, UIP emphysema. We transplant probably two or three sarcoids a year, um, which I always thought was like a no-no. You just don't because of recurrence, but yeah. we do them anyway. Huh. I was wondering. Hopefully, it won't take her off the list. No, but they might. Yeah, they they need to reconcile her meds and see if there's anything that could be causing a sarcoid-like reaction. I don't know. It's just yeah. weird. But anyway, cool. it is a few minutes after the hour, so. 
think All right, guys. that'll do it. Thanks. So, uh, Travis, in, in response to your question about the symptoms of the nocardia guy, he had uh, he had very mild symptoms that were slowly progressive shortness of breath okay. for over nine months, and never had fever. Wow. So I would have been worried about even lung cancer, like an, a pneumonic or or mucinous adenocarcinoma, or even lymphoma right. in the lungs with that look. So, yeah. Great. Thanks. Okay. All right. Cool. Thanks, everyone. All right, take care. Bye. Bye.